Ayn Rand was born Alicia Rosenblum in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia in 1905. Uh, she was born to a, a middle class uh, Jewish family. Her father was a pharmacist, he owned his own pharmacy. And uh, they, when she was uh, 12, they witnessed, she witnessed the Russian Revolution and the rise of communism uh, in Russia. The pharmacy, of course, was nationalized, was taken away. Uh, they, uh, they had to give up their uh, apartments. Uh, they had to move in with other families. You've heard, I don't know if you've heard, but hopefully you know a little bit about the history of the Soviet Union and what happened in Russia under communism. It was a horrific uh, period of time, uh, a period of time in which they tried to uh, move to the, the, the part of Russia that was ruled by the whites, which were the anti-communists, and moved back and forth. And, um, and she got to experience firsthand what communism was really like, what, what life under communism was. And she came to the conclusion in her teens, in her early 20s, she came to the conclusion uh, that she would not survive. She would not, she would be killed. She could not keep her mouth shut. She did not like the system. She objected to it on a very principled, fundamental uh, way. Uh, and, uh, and she did everything she could to get out of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, she wrote a book later in life called We the Living. Uh, I highly recommend it. It is a beautiful book. Uh, and it's about the life of a young woman in Soviet Russia uh, and her life there, the disasters that occur and her attempt to get out of there. So uh, she wrote, it's not a biography, uh, but it's semi-biographical in the sense that it reflects much of what happens uh, to, uh, to Anne uh, during those years. It was actually interesting, just as an aside, uh, it was actually made into a movie without Iron Man's knowledge in uh, the early 1940s in fascist Italy under Mussolini. It was made, uh, and uh, the fascist regime thought, oh, this is a movie that's anti-communist. <laughs> so fine, you can go ahead and make the movie. And they made the movie. It's a beautiful movie uh, with Anita Valley, who's a gorgeous actress, and very, very well made, and, and it went out into the theaters. And as part of this, a copy was sent to uh, Goebbels, uh, the head of proper, you know, the guy responsible for propaganda in Germany under the Nazis. And Goebbels watched the movie and immediately telegraphed Mussolini that the movie was not an anti-communist movie. The movie was an anti-authoritarianism movie. And that he should gather up all the copies and burn them, and they did. They gather all the copies and they build them. One survived. And it exists. Uh, it's been cleaned up. The, the, the picture's been cleaned up. The sound has been cleared up. It's a beautiful movie. It's, you know, Italian movie making. They know how to make movies. One thing they know how to make. Um, well, they're fast cars. But um, I highly recommend it if you ever get a chance to watch uh, the movie. Of course, read the book as well. Anyway, at the age of uh, uh, early 20s, in her early 20s, there was a little window in which Lenin allowed people to leave uh, to leave Russia to study overseas or to do a project on the condition, of course, that they came back. Uh, and she had an opportunity to go supposedly to go study America, American movie making. She had uh, done a degree at a, at a Russian university and she had the opportunity to leave. She had relatives in Chicago who owned a movie theater, who wrote her a letter saying, that she was invited to come, and uh, she was allowed to leave. Everybody in her family and everybody knew she would never come back. That is, that this, she was leaving for good. Uh, she spent a little bit in Chicago, but she immediately headed out to Hollywood. Uh, here's a, a, a 22, 23-year-old young woman from Russia. Um, second language, third language, fourth language is English. She knew French and German as well. Uh, she arrives in Hollywood. Her dream is to be a writer for the movies. She had, as a young girl, watched movies, Hollywood movies, and fallen in love with movie making. And uh, so she goes, uh, you guys won't know who this is, but Cecil B. DeMille, uh, maybe some of the older people, movie buffs know, the biggest movie maker of the time, 
She goes to see Sabita Mill movie studio, says, you know, here I am, I want to work in the movies. And they basically say, you know, don't call us, we'll call you, kind of by. <laughs> she walks out, this is a true story, right? She walks out, and out right outside the door is this big convertible. And in the convertible is Cisa B. DeMille. And she, this little Russian girl, is staring at him. And he says, you know, what's up? Why, why are you staring at me? So she tells him the story. Of she loves his movies. She loves uh, uh, movies generally. She's come to Hollywood. She wants to, she wants to write for the movies. She says, okay, get in the car. So she gets in the car, and he takes her to where they're filming um, uh, the story, uh, the King of Kings, the story of Jesus Christ. And he says, we're making this movie. Here's a pass for a week. You can hang out, and you can see how movies are made. And she did. She became an extra on the movie. She met her future husband on the movie set. And that started a career in the movie industry. She later on got all kinds of odds and ends jobs. She would work in the wardrobe and all kinds of things, all while studying English, writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And by the early 1930s, um, she had written a play that was successful in Los Angeles and made it to Broadway. She didn't like the Broadway production, but it made it to Broadway and gave us an income. Uh, she was writing uh, We the Living, the book, uh, which was published in uh, the 1930s, got awful reviews because uh, New York in the 1930s was, you could argue, a satellite of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the communists. Uh, there were a lot of communists, particularly in the cultural world in New York of the 1930s. The left, by the way, wasn't invented yesterday. <laughs> the left's been around for a long time. I think a lot of young people think that uh, this left is you know, was invented, but they mean and they be dominant in in the cultural world, particularly in America, for a long time and in Europe. Um, and uh, she, uh, so she, uh, she she got the play, she got the book, she started writing in Hollywood. She wrote a couple of movies. Ultimately, she wrote uh, she started write. She wrote a little book called Anthem, um, which you can get. It's a very short book. Takes you two hours to read. And that was published, wasn't published in the U.S. You couldn't find a U.S. publisher. It was published in England, where um, a, a young writer um, who uh, went on to write uh, Animal Farm in 1984 probably read it before he wrote those books. So there's a good chance that uh, she had an influence on uh, uh, on him. And then uh, and then she started writing uh, The Fountainhead, which was her first major project. And The Fountainhead... Uh, was pub was came out in uh, 1943 and it was rejected by 12 publishers. 12 publishers said, "Ah, this won't sell. It's too philosophical. It's too idealistic." Um, the 12th publisher picked it up. They didn't print a lot of copies because they said, "Ah, it won't sell a lot." So they printed just a few cop, two thousand copies, I think. It sold very quickly. They immediately had to reprint, and it became a New York Times bestseller, uh, and it became a massive hit. Later made it a movie with Gary Cooper uh, in Hollywood, and uh, uh, that kind of launched Ayn Rand into becoming, I think, the name that she became. Uh, I lost to say that during this period in the 1940s, she got involved with uh, kind of freedom-loving organizations. Uh, she got involved with uh, different parts of the American kind of classical liberal um, scene. Uh, uh, it didn't always go very well. Uh, but but she was uh, she was very involved um, uh, in in FEMI, the, the Foundation for Economic Engagement, which today is, is a major player in kind of the, the free market world. Uh, she then wrote Atlas Shrug. Atlas Shrug uh, came out in 1957. Uh, by the time Atlas Shrug was published, every publisher wanted it, so they were competing. They were bidding against each other to get it. Uh, so she made a lot of money on Atlas Shrug. Atlas Shrug again became a massive bestseller. Still, Fontenay to this day are bestsellers in a sense that if the if the bestseller lists included old books, they would have to be included because they sell so many copies. Uh, probably the best year ever for Ayn Rand's books, Fontenay at the Shrug, was uh, somewhere between 2009 and 2013 during the Tea Party in the United States. 
where those two books sold in excess of half a million copies. And all of Iron Man books sold about a million copies in one year, which is a huge number. But Arthur, who is long dead, it's unheard of. Particularly an author that everybody hates. Particularly an author that's not taught in universities or in schools, right? Uh, from 1957 on until uh, she passed away in 1982, she wrote philosophy. She wrote about capitalism. She wrote about liberty. She wrote about freedom. Uh, she wrote from a philosophical perspective, which I'll describe in a minute. Uh, she gave talks. She gave lectures. She gave interviews. A lot of the interviews she did on television are now available. You can find them on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, a lot of that is being republished by the Ayn Institute, put up online, uh, fantastic interviews. Uh, she was quite a character. If you've never seen her in person, wow. I mean, again, little little old lady by this point. And she had an amazing power and amazing uh, ability to grip the audience. So I encourage you to watch those interviews. Uh, she did three interviews with Johnny Carson. Again, the young people here wouldn't know who Johnny Carson was, but he was the late night host in, in America. And uh, if you watch that, note how different television is today from what it was back then, in terms of people actually speaking, in terms of actual interviews. And what we do in podcasts today was television back then, mm -hmm. right? Where you actually have time to develop ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, she died in 1982. The Ironman Institute was founded in 1985. And Jika all these little cards on the table over there, if you scan the barcode, you can download a free copy of one of Iron Man's books, your choice, um, electronic, obviously. Also, there's a sheet there uh, with information about a conference that the Iron Man Institute is having in Athens, in Greece, in April. Um, it's going to be a kind of, we do a, once a year, we do a conference, a European conference. This will be in Athens. Uh, particularly if you're young and a student, we offer a lot of scholarships. A lot of people come there, we pay your way, we pay you to attend. So um, feel free to start applying. I think applications will open up in November. So it's just my, it's my public uh, service announcement. So let me talk a little bit about Ayn Rand's ideas. And I want to do it from a particular perspective. You know, I think everybody in this room is, to one extent or another, an advocate for liberty, an, an advocate for freedom. We all believe that freedom, individual liberty, is something that we should fight for. It's something we strive to achieve. It's something we would like to change the culture and the world and our political system to attain. I think there's an important question we all have to ask. And I think I'm going to ask and answer this in a unique way. And that question is why? Why freedom? Why liberty? <clears throat> Particularly the kind of freedom and liberty we're talking about, which is so unpopular. Right? We're the minority, the tiniest of minorities. And the reason I ask this question is because freedom and liberty are very unusual. Like, they never happen in, in human history. I mean, today, we are super free in comparison to almost all of human history. I mean, you guys had a dictatorship here as recently as 1974. And before that, you had kings and queens, and you never had liberty and freedom. In a sense, so we mean, and this is not unique to Portugal, this is true of humanity. The human species has had really tiny little brief periods of a little bit of freedom. Greece, 2,500 years ago, Roman Republic, which didn't last very long. Maybe you could argue a little period in Venice's history. That's it. Until the 18th century, 19th century, that is it. So most people, certainly in history, but even today, don't believe in freedom. They don't believe it. They don't want it. And therefore, we have to do something to motivate liberty. You can't just go out there with a big flag and say, freedom, liberty. It reminds me... Uh, of this movie, I don't know if you ever saw, uh, I'm sure you all saw Braveheart, everybody's seen the movie Braveheart with uh, Mel Gibson, okay? mm -hmm. and he portrays Wallace, and he's, he's fighting for something in Scotland, right? And there's a scene where they're all yelling, freedom, you know, we want freedom. This is, I don't know, 14th century, 13th century. What do they, what do they mean by freedom? What do they mean by freedom? 
nothing like what we mean by freedom. What they mean by freedom is we want to be ruled by a Scottish king, not an English king. We want to be oppressed by our own people, not by those people. All they want is the same kind of oppressive government as the English had. They just wanted to be a Scot because they were a little racist. <laughs> it really is. There's no freedom there, not in the sense that we understand, not in the sense that it your liberty, not in the sense of living your life based on your values, based on your judgment, living life free of coercion, free of force, free of authority. That, nobody believes it. They all want coercion and force and authority. As long as the force and coercion and authority are in a good cause. As long as it's to bring, make the world a better place. And of course, every dictator, every king, every authoritarian, every totalitarian in all of human history has always done what they've done because they want to make the world a better place. No authoritarian has ever come to power and said, I'm here because I just like power and I don't care about these people. <laughs> I don't think they even believe that because I don't think psychologically they can hold that. I think they have to convince themselves in order to do the evil that they do, they have to convince themselves that they're there to make the world somehow a better place. So there's something more we have to advocate for than liberty, because we have to ask so the question, why? Many libertarians, many classical liberals start with something like the non-aggression principle. Well, non-aggression is good. Again, why? Most people are fine. As long as the majority votes for the aggression, <laughs> it's cool. Stealing is fine as long as it's majority approved. Silencing is fine as long as the majority approved. So there has to be something more. There has to be a reason why we believe in the non-aggression principle. There has to be something that says aggression is bad. For whom? For what? By what standard? And, and the point, I think, part of the point I'm trying to make is, look, we won, those of us who believe in liberty, we won the economic debate a long time ago. Like Hayek beat Keynes. Mises even beat Hayek, right? I mean, freedom, we, we, we got the arguments. We, we can answer Marx's arguments economically. We can answer Keynes's argument economically. We know markets work. And we've proven it, and there's a gazillion examples all over the world. We check the list if anybody wants, but they're all out there. And yet, we're still stuck, as the tiniest of minorities. This is not about economics. The fight for liberty and the fight for freedom is not about economics as much as so many classical liberals would like it to be, and maybe. They like it to be that because so many classical liberals were economists. And economists see the world through economics. That's all they can see in the world. And when those economists dabble in their more philosophical foundations, they often tend to be conventional. And the sad thing about conventionality is convention always leads to the same thing. Statism, it always leads to coercion and force and authority in the name of some common good. If we're going to advocate for a new political system, we have to advocate for a new philosophy. And this is what Rand does. She doesn't just start with the existing philosophy and say, all right, we'll start from here and we'll build a new foundation. It doesn't work that way. And if you build something, it'll crumble because the, the, the base is quicksand. The base has built statism. Everything, all the philosophy that's come before us has built the world we have today. It's not a bad world. There's some good in it, but it's not the world that we believe we can build. So for Rand, she's not for freedom because GDP will go up. She's not for liberty because we'll get a better economy. All of that is true because we'll be wealthier. All of that is true and all of that is good. There's nothing wrong with being richer. Cool. But that's not why she's for liberty. She is for liberty because she believes that it is the only political system that facilitates and allows people to be moral. And for her, morality is 
It's the only political system that allows people to live their lives in pursuit of their happiness using their rational mind because it's the only system that takes out takes out of the equation, rejects the thing that is the enemy of the human mind, enemy of reason. What's the enemy of reason? Force, coercion. I put a gun to your back of your head, reason doesn't matter anymore. You do what I tell you. I tell you, as, a, as, a, as the FDA, that Sudden, uh, if I tell you as the FDA, as the regulatory agency responsible for drug development, I tell you this area over here, we're never going to approve it. You don't think about that area anymore. It's done, it's finished, it's gone. What's the point? You're never going to get permission, you're never going to develop it, you're never going to do anything. No venture capitalist will fund it. The mind is just shrunk, the opportunities are just shrunk, reality is just shrunk. Regulations, force, coercion, authority. Think of what the Catholic Church did to Galileo, right? Can't think. <clears throat> There's certain things you can't think. So you don't think. Think about how science was probably held back decades, maybe more, by the fact that the church were born. At the state, people who came up with scientific theories that didn't match an old book, right? That weren't consistent. So first coercion, post and coercion are enemies of the human mind. And for Rand, everything in a sense boils down to the human mind. Because she looks at she looks at us at human beings and she says, well, what makes us special? What what is what makes human beings human beings? You know, and it's interesting because I, I do a lot of talks in classes and at, at, at universities and high schools, and I ask kids, well, what makes human beings human beings? What is it that makes us human? And it's fascinating the range of the responses you get. Almost never the right one, but all the responses, right? I, I tell them in advance that they can't say thumbs <laughs> because, you know, they're anthropologists who claim this is what makes us special, right? Thumbs. They'll say, I don't know, they'll say empathy. They'll say communication. They'll say all kinds of things that almost always relate to your relationship with other people. But what makes human beings human? What makes communication possible? Reason. reason. Your ability to think. Our ability to reason. That's what makes us human. We're just an animal without it. What makes us human is our ability to not just observe the world out there, which every animal can do, but to form concepts and to form abstractions and abstractions on abstractions. And then to integrate those abstractions to a view about the world, a scientific view about how it works, and then take our knowledge and go change that world to adapt to us. I mean, no other animal does that. In that sense, right, we change our environment to fit, fit our needs. This is, you know, my, my argument against the environmentalists, right? It's not about us leaving the environment alone. Human beings survive by changing their environment. Mm -hmm. If we leave the environment alone, we die. We cannot survive. We chop down trees to build huts. We, 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 uh, you know, cultivate the land, create agriculture. That's not nature. That's us doing it. How many people can survive by picking berries and nuts? Very few. And when we hunt, anybody here have the gene for hunting? Nobody has the pretense of that. Some, some countries you go, they all think they have the gene for hunting. Um, nobody has a gene for hunting. I put you in the middle of the Amazon. <laughs> you don't instinctually know what to do. You might speak the language, but you don't instinctually know what to do. What do you have to do in order to survive in the Amazon? Or well, anyway, let's think. <laughs> Figure it out. What food is poison? What is not? What, how do I build traps to catch animals? How do I hunt? How do I... There's a lot of thinking to do. 
Human survival requires thinking, and your survival requires adapting the environment to spit out meat. So, man is a rational being. Reason requires what in order to for you to be free to think, to use your mind. What do you need in order to be able to use your mind? You need freedom. You need to be left alone. You need the gun to be withdrawn. You need the regulators to go home. You need the authorities to shut up. And slowly not to impose their will on you. You need the freedom to think really and to act on those thoughts. Human beings require that in order to survive. Survive fully as human beings. In order to thrive. In order to be successful. We must be allowed to think and act on our thoughts. Some of the stuff we think will be wrong. We will fail sometimes. That's okay. Failure is part of the equation. Learn from that. Rise up. Try again. Try something different. But to think we have to be free. So, to be, so the reason we want to be free is so that we're free to think and act on those thoughts. And it's important to note that that's how human beings survive, thrive, flourish. And at the end of the day, what's the purpose of thinking and what's the purpose of life? So one of the things that we're not born with is the instinctual knowledge of how to live, how to survive in the Amazon or anywhere really. But we're not born with the code that tells us what values we should pursue, how we are supposed to live. In a sense, we're not born with morality. Morality should be the guide to action, how, how to live. What to do is right, what not to do, that's wrong. We're not born with that. We have to figure that out. Reason is the means of figuring it out. We don't have any other. And for what purpose? What do we need morality for? This is our man asking. What do we need morality for? Well, we need morality to provide us with principles, with guidelines on how to live, how to survive, how to thrive, how to be successful, how to live the best life we can live. The purpose of morality, according to Rand, and here she's in a sense channeling Aristotle, the purpose of morality is to learn how to live the good life. It's how to live a successful life as a human being, not as an animal, as a human being. So we want to identify the values of virtue that lead us to success at living, to success as a rational animal, as a reasoning being. So she rejects 2,000 years of morality. She rejects the idea that morality is about sacrifice, that morality is about other people. So, you know, we're so hardwired, we're so wired in the sense of our educational system to think of other people. And when you ask people what makes a you, what makes a human being a human being, we immediately think about other people. We immediately think about empathy. We immediately think about communicating. We immediately think about groups. It's not the individual. But what you actually need morality is to give you guidance of living because life is complicated. It's, com it's complex. The world out there is complex. You need some principles to know. You know, I figured out that lying is not good. Not going to lie. I don't have to refigure it out every single time. I've got a principle. That's what principles serve. Generalizations that are shortcuts make it easy for us to actually act in the world. So morality is there to give you that, to give you these shortcuts, to give you these principles on what a good life looks like and what a bad life looks like. So Rand develops an original ethical code. She articulates that code in a, in a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, which is pretty radical, right? Selfish is associated with really bad behaviors normally. But for Rand, being selfish means pursuing your own happiness. Being selfish means living the best life that you can. Being selfish means finding those objective values, those scientifically determined values 
that will actually lead you to happiness, that actually lead you to success as a human being, as a rational being. So, so I covered you to be the virtue of selfishness. I think is an unbelievably important work. So, if you're a rational being who needs to think in order to survive and to thrive, what is the number one virtue that objective is my man's philosophy articulates? What's the most important value that you want to attain? Well, for man, the most important value is reason. You want to be good at thinking. You want to attain, and you want to engage with that because thinking is not automatic. You think it's automatic, you're not doing it. Hmm. You're not doing it. Thinking requires effort. It requires turning a switch on. It requires mental focus and mental energy. It's not just something that happens. It's something you have to make happen. It's a choice. Much of the world out there is not thinking. Part of the problem we face, many of you I'm sure have argued with a lot of people, and you come to the conclusion, it's hopeless. And part of the issue is that they're not thinking. Part of it might be you're not making good arguments. <laughs> but part of it is they're not thinking. Thinking is an achievement. Thinking is, is an effort that people have to make. You, you, you can tell, I don't know, you're studying for a hard math exam, and you really engage. Well, that's what you should do when deciding about anything really important in life. You should really engage. You should really focus your mind. Because it's this, your mind, that is going to solve your problems. And almost always when we get into trouble as individuals in life, right? it's because we don't think it's it. It's because we go by emotion, we rush, we, we follow our heart, not our mind. And it's almost never the case that you think, yeah, I, I, I devoted too much energy to thinking about this problem. Because that's the only way we can actually solve problems is using them. So the essence of Venice philosophy, the essence of moral philosophy is think. Use your mind, figure it out. Whatever it is that you're looking for, whatever it is that you're seeking. And in the case of morality, what you should be seeking is your own success at living, your own happiness all the time. So I'll, I'll try to wrap up. So, for Rand, she cares about liberty. She cares about freedom. Primarily because she cares about morality. Because she wants people to have the opportunity to use their minds, to use their reason, to their happiness, by picking their own values, picking their own virtues, and seeking Fulfilling life, flourishing life, mm -hmm. without barriers, without constraints, without authoritarians telling them what they can and cannot do. And since, in order to do that, they have to use their mind, we have to extract force from society. We have to find ways to get force, coercion out of society. And it's only by extracting force from society, which is liberty and freedom, that we liberate the human mind. To allow individuals to pursue happiness. That's the why for freedom, the why for freedom. Thank you. Hey, okay, let's make a uh, question and answer. Sure. The only reason to give a talk is that question. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I think it's better. For the person to go up, rise, and uh, yeah, yeah. When you said for your nice speech, I love it, especially the way you did it. It was very American. I, I love it. Therefore, but let me try to reason it in another way. So you focus on the reason. <coughs> I'm a, I'm a man of science, and many times I make mistakes. So many times I start to. The demonstration or I thought the experience when I started to hear, and then I can say, Okay, I, I, I was wrong. Then I kept back. So I have two 
arguments against the, the idea first. You put emotions out of the police. Uh, according to the Nazi, emotions were first moved into reason. You put it out of the reason. Uh, how, how can you reason in a proper way? <coughs> second, second, second problem. You put more, you create a new model. Then we started to make a new experience. And what is interesting is that now we discuss if we can do an experience with rights. What? With right with mouse. We yeah. discussed it. Some yeah. person discussed about it. But no one discussed about it. Can this uh, make an experience in a, in a, in a, in a social environment? And most of the previous uh, ideas of uh, reason uh, that were very nice in those times, Marx and so on, in the end we end, end into a we crash, first mm -hmm. crash. Yeah. When I was young, there was a lot of person that believed that. Yeah. I never believed in that. But it was. Yeah. So, uh, our, can, can yeah. Uh, yeah. we going to the adopting the team and end in a uh, not being correct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so you know, so I, I, I live with, with another idea. If we put emotions out of the equation, uh, I, I can I can be a brilliant guy. And then I, I can start to say, okay, I'm brilliant, I have a lot of money. And all the other guys that are not so brilliant than myself. I can just lose them. Mm How -hmm. can we do society? Yeah. We find the love. Yeah, so uh, a lot to say about what you're saying. First, of course you can make mistakes. But the interesting thing is the only way to correct your mistakes is using reason. There's no other way to correct your mistakes. You don't correct your mistakes to say, I, I feel the truth. No, I, I observe that what I've done is doesn't work. I go back to the drawing board and I figure out a better way to do it. But the only way to do that is through observation and through integration, and that is reasoning. So there's no way to, to error correct without reason. Second, I'm not dismissing emotion. I'm dismissing emotions as tools of cognition. I'm an emotional guy. I think you can see. Right? Mm -hmm. um, emotions are not the way we should make decisions in life. Emotions are not means of knowledge except about ourselves. What my emotions tell me is about me and about how I respond to certain stimuli. They don't tell me the truth except about myself. So emotions are super important. They're important motivators. They're important self for self-knowledge. And, uh, and, and, and uh, you live your emotions, right? At the end of the day, what is happiness? It's an emotion. It's an experience that you feel emotionally. It's a state of being, but it's very close to being an emotion. Joy is an emotion. Of course, I want to feel joy. So emotions are super important. But emotions don't come from the ether. They don't just come from nowhere. Emotions are based on conclusions that we have already come to. Emotions are responses that we have to the world out there based on our beliefs, based on our values. Uh, there's some great examples of this. You can show exactly the same scene to two different people, but depending on the values that they have, they will respond emotionally, completely differently to that scene. So emotions are responses to the world out there, and they're great. So I'm not dismissing emotions. And then the third thing was... Dismissing other people. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very unreasonable to dismiss other people. Not because of emotions, but because of the value, the objective, factual, rational value we get from other people. We get immense value from other people. I couldn't eat if not for other people. I don't know how to grow food. You know how to grow food? No. So I go to the supermarket and I buy my food from other people. And then they buy it from people who grow the food. And I mean, the division of labor is one of the most amazing, beautiful things. And it makes us connected with other people in, in deep ways. That's just material. 
But then, uh, you know, uh, you know, I love arts. What, what would my life be with Dr. Michelangelo? Like, you know, I love artists. I love people who spiritually enhance my life. And then, what about friendship and love and romantic love? All of these are values to to a human being, to a rational human being, not to an emotional uh, zombie, but to a rational human being that express through emotion. But they're all values. So there is no conflict between the individual and uh, you know the the the, the collect, so called collective through the group, right? It doesn't have to be a conflict. And what makes sure there isn't the conflict? is the political idea of individual rights. That is, you might not like other people. You know, you're a genius, you think other people are useless, but you can't harm them. You can go live on a desert island, you can go build your home somewhere, you can be alone if you want, but you can't harm other people because they have rights and we have built a political system to protect those rights. So individual rights are key to the political, to, to moving from ethics to, uh, to politics is this concept of individual rights that basically says that every individual has the freedom to act based on their own, based on their own mind and pursuit of their own values, without coercion, without force, without authority. That individual right prevents the kind of hostility, the kind of damage that a genius might do to other people. But it's not in his self interest. It would be a stupid thing for somebody to do. Because of the immense value we get from others. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to... <laughs> so you mentioned and when decided to accept a job to write about a movie about God, and she was really against God. Do you think she created a higher value for a lesser value during that period? Because I'm not sure you wrote a movie about God. Now she writes a movie about God, like the, the uh, she performed a movie. What God at the beginning when she went to all you? I think you mentioned that. Was that a part of the beginning of the talk? Oh, she was an extra. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, my question is do you think she traded a higher value for a lesser value by accepting it? I'm mean, sure you went along with a movie about Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, I plan to see, I know, go see Qua Vais or, or, or uh, you know, <laughs> religious movies. There's nothing wrong. I, I love, it's not my favorite artwork. You could argue it's religious upward. I mean, uh, Michelangelo's Pietà, right, is one of the most amazing, stunning, beautiful, emotionally that you'll ever see in the world, right? It's Jesus and Mary. And you can say, ah, it's just religious art. But art is so much more than the religion. Art, it, it, if it's good, it, it has universal values. And telling the story of Jesus Christ in a movie by a secular director, excuse me, DeMille, there's no religious, right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, you know, in participating in that. So it's not even trading. It's just, it's a value. You got a job. It's and a, it's in a movie, but the director was a genius. Nothing, nothing there's no undermining. One reference, I think, uh, some, uh, Tommaso uh, Aquino, Aquino was one, uh, one uh, reference, Aquinas, sorry. Oh, yeah, she, she, she was a huge admirer of Thomas Aquinas. But she said Thomas Aquinas brought reason back into the West after it disappeared through the Dark Ages, right? So it, 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 Aristotle disappeared with Rome and then came back with Aquinas. And, and interestingly, he came back to, with Aquinas because the Arabs had preserved the writings and brought them here, right, to, to a little bit of south of here, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. This is where the, the biggest libraries uh, of uh, Greek literature and Greek um, uh, theater were, were all in, in, um, in um, what is now Spain, and uh, in the libraries there, those are the copies where the Christians conquered Spain. Those were the libraries that they took back to Italy. The Thomas Aquinas read it with, with Aristotle. So he read uh, translations from the Arabic that was translated from the Latin that was translated from the Greek. So. But, but Aristotle was lost for, for a thousand years, it was lost to civilization, other than the Arab civilization, it was lost to the West. Okay, please stand up. I have a question. Um, yeah. How would you dismantle the argument about common good? How do you fight this when you talk to other people? So how do you dismantle the idea of the common good? Well, the fundamental is there is no common. So there is no, there's nothing common, right? So there's a group of people 
and, and you're one person and he's another person, but collectives, groups, are just groups of individuals. The fundamental unit in reality, both observable and with emotions and with thoughts, and is the individual. There's no group consciousness. There's no group values. There's no group, uh, you know, I, 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 a group can't eat for me. A group can't think for me. A group can't, I mean, they think they can think for me, they can't. <laughs> And they can't value for me. So only individuals can value. Only individuals can think. So only individuals have good. Now, there's a sense in which you can talk about the common good. But only in the sense of what's good for individuals. In the commons. Right? And what's good for the individuals in the commons is reason and, and liberty. Right? So, so that, that thread, that's good for you as an individual. And therefore, if you put a bunch of individuals together, it's still good for each one of those individuals. So we need to we need to refine and make sure that as they interact, they don't, you know, that's individual rights. Yeah. They don't start hitting each other. So then when you like, of course, this was a, a question that we already know the answer, of course, but I wanted to lead to something else. Yes. Um, Milton Friedman used to say, if, uh, if the majority votes to shoot the other, the others, uh, would you do it? No. So, how can you correct democracy as it is right now? Because what we see is that this type of democracy that we have. So the only to... way, again, the only way, in a sense, to challenge the world as it is today is to challenge the fundamentals. So behind the question of if the majority chose to, to shoot this guy, you wouldn't do it. Or the majority decides to tax you and not to tax him or to tax you and give it to him or whatever. All of that is based, for example, that is based, the way it's phrased, is based on a utilitarian view of morality. Mm -hmm. The greatest good for the greatest number of people, the greatest good for them. Mm -hmm. Utilitarianism is a, is a nasty system. It's a bad system. Mm -hmm. But you have to be able to replace it with something. You know, people need a moral code. And if you're not, if you're going to say utilitarian is not a good moral code, then you need to have an alternative moral code. And this is, again, what, what you need. Look, the reason we're not succeeding, in my view, the reason the liberty movement is not succeeding and not really making a dent out there in the world is because we're afraid to challenge what matters. We're willing, we, we take their language, utilitarian language, and Milton Friedman was guilty of this, as much as I love him, he was guilty of this. We take their language and we try to tell them a story about how, in their terms, our system is bad. But it's not. Because they're not about happiness. They're not about success. They're not. It's not their purpose. They're about sacrifice and suffering. Many of them. Right? So you can't take their standard and use it against them. You have to, particularly when the standard is wrong, you have to question the standard. And in this case, you have to question utilitarianism. And you have to present an alternative. The reason I think we're losing it, we're afraid to challenge morality. Libertarians and free market people are very comfortable talking about economics. We're very, very comfortable talking about economics. We know it all. <clears throat> but that nobody cares. What really matters is I want to be a good person. And if being good means I have to pay taxes, I'm willing to pay taxes. If being good means that we have to silence certain people, I'm willing to silence certain people. I want to be good. So your job is to question what they mean by good. Not just what they mean by the common good. What do they mean by the individual good? What do they mean by how you should live your life? And then show them that the only way, if you have a proper perspective on the good, the only way then to manifest it in reality is to be free. And that's why we're pro free. We're pro free of something that can be good. Uh, wait, oops, sorry, Antonio. Uh, for all comments, thank you for this event. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I agree, you know, as an objectivist, I agree with most of the philosophical things you do. But regarding uh, your answer to fixing democracy, uh, just going back to what I we talked about, I got on last year. Um, one of the things I know you taught me a lot, but one of the things you taught me was that you cannot force a man to think. That thought is important, but that you cannot force a man to think. Mm -hmm. So, 
While we are here all focused on liberty, living our own lives and acquiring knowledge, there is a group, a large group of the population that we cannot afford to think. So what guarantee is there that no matter how knowledgeable and freedom loving we become, we'll be able to change the system from the inside that requires the majority vote? So my question to you is, why instead of trying to change the system from within, trying to change the system from without, you're laughing because you know where I'm going, but yeah, I have to answer this question already, right? <laughs> you, you, you wrote my answer. Asking anyone, look, I'm going to look. I'm open any way to change the system. If if you can find an island some way, convert it to capitalism, make it uh, make it this shining success, and it exists already. what's that? It exists already. It doesn't have exist. It, I visited a few Wait. ago in Honduras. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, it exists under the thumb of the Honduran government. <laughs> for, uh, for now, yes. It exists under the thumb of the Honduran government. If Honduras changes its constitution, that city is gone. Of course, that city is still not free. Because you try to start a bank in that city. A bank, let me finish, a bank that is truly private, a bank that is actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way the Swiss banks used to be, right? Truly private, truly secret, and all of that. You won't last. I, I, I will, I'm willing to put money, real money, on the table. That if you try to start a bank like that, they try to start a bank like that, they will be shut down. There is, I'm, yesterday I met the founder of the first bank. That's fine, but it will be shut down. I'm, I'm not arguing that they will try. I'm arguing that the powers to be in the world, the Federal Reserve and the Central Bankers of the world and the military to stand behind them, will not allow you because they'll accuse you of money laundering. They'll accuse you of, 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 uh, of being the banker or the drug dealers. They'll accuse you. They'll make up any excuse they want to shut you down. And if the, and if the founding fathers thought that way, would be of the United States. Uh, big, the huge difference. But, you know, we can have this okay. argument offline. Mm -hmm. The huge difference. Thank you. Partially in the relative, um, in the, in the relative uh, availability of force to both parties. But the fact is that I've seen libertarians try this for 40 years now. Um, start little islands, start little projects. This is the best. How oh, objective is right? This is too small. Um, but Honduras is the best. Um, and part of the reason why it's the best is because they're willing to compromise. And I, I, my guess is by the time the bank opens, it won't be a truly free bank because they'll already have compromised because they know they can be shut down. The people behind this, behind the Honduras thing, are people of the world. They know how the world works and they know the forces at large that would prevent a truly free bank functioning. Uh, and they will, they will, you know, I told you what I think. The only way to have a truly free society is an plan. Is having a new penalty. You don't need to point to Moscow. Moscow is useless. A nuclear bomb. Only way to have a free society is to have a nuclear bomb pointed to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and then they'll leave you alone. But if you think that the powers to be will not leave you, will, will, will let you run, a, for example, a free bank or, or have a place where where you can trade in, in drugs, not that I'm for drugs, but you can trade in drugs and things like that, or develop new medicines without the regulatory approval. You're in for a big surprise by by uh, by the people out there. So that you know, you need to be able to make sure that they won't come after you. Um, you, 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 you. We always have the, the other people, so we have to live with the other people. Um, uh, even uh, you, you don't agree, they don't agree with us, let's say us, and uh, it's not a question of compromise. So in the end, it's ideas that must be yes. always put forward. And so only ideas can change the world, let's say. <laughs> and, uh, uh, sorry, I think you lost trust. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I was wondering, as as representing the Ayn Rand Institute, how you would differentiate objectivism from the other schools of thought, the Chicago School, the Austrian School, the Anacast. So how do you differentiate it? How is the Ayn Rand Institute more worthy of our attention than, say, 
paid or needs it. So it's a great question. Um, so first, Einstein presents a philosophy. She doesn't just present an economic theory. So if you look at the Chicago School, it basically accepts utilitarianism and presents an economic theory based on utilitarianism that uh, maximizes utility, that maximizes economic efficiency, however you want to call it. Um, it flirts with statism periodically. Milton Friedman was a big fan of central banking, not to the end. He changed his mind at the end, but he was a big fan of central banking. Um, and Rand would reject it because she would reject any use of force. And central banking requires force. So Chicago School is a, is a good, I think flawed, um, economic theory. The Austrian School is very similar, just I think a better economic theory. Uh, I think the Austrians are right in the fundamentals in terms of economics. The, 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 they, they got the broad outline of economics right. I think they got you know, the business cycle mostly right. I don't think completely right, but mostly right. They're still missing some elements, but that's work to be done. The, the right methodology and the right ideas are there. It's just a matter of getting it done. So the Austrian school is excellent when it comes to economics. And so I think they're cutting edge. I think they could learn a few things from Chicago, but, but you know, that's just me. Uh, but again, that's economics, that's science. You know, let the science fall where it may. When the Austrians try to do anything but economics, I think they're terrible. I don't think they're particularly good social thinkers. I don't think they're particularly good uh, philosophical thinkers. I don't think they're particularly good at thinking outside of economics. And, and the same is true, by the way, of Chicago. Because Gary Becker, for example, in Chicago, tried to explain everything in terms of economics. Right? So that was his philosophy. Philosophy was out. Sociology was out. Psychology was out. All that matters is economics, right? So who you marry is determined from yeah. economic factors. <laughs> I mean, so complete nonsense in my view. Um, interesting, often fun, uh, but but not but not fundamentally uh, sound. And I think the same thing is true in Austria. As love, I, I think von Mises was the greatest economist who ever lived, yeah. right? But his paxology is not very good. No. So I don't think it's very valuable because he's trying to do philosophy. He's out of his league. It's not his thing. His thing is economics. And economics is super, right? Uh, I think all of them, you know, starting with Menga, von Bavik, uh, uh, Mises, that whole line is, that, you know, they've got the economic thinking down. They've got it right. Um, I don't know. Do you really want me to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, an output capitalism, in my view, is a contradiction in terms. There's no such thing as capitalism without government. Sorry. Um, you know, ANCAPS, uh, you know, anarchy is maybe the most barbaric form of human existence. I think it is a disaster. I think it's all about bloodshed. I think it would be horrible to live in a world like that. And yes, I've read uh, David Friedman, and I've read Rothbard, and I've read all the explanations, and does it, it, it's detached from reality, it's detached from the real world. And what it rejects is the idea of objective values and objective law. It rejects the idea of individual rights. You cannot have individual rights and anarchy at the same time. Not if you have competing governments over the same territory. So, um, so I, I, I think Rothbard, the problem with Rothbard is he's a subjectivist. He's a subjectivist in uh, his uh, fundamentally in epistemology, but, but more importantly in morality. He's a, he's, a, he's a subjectivist in ethics, and that undermines him. Uh, again, his economics, fantastic. But once you get to the, to, the, uh, to the philosophy, I think he falls apart. So I think the problem is that all these schools of thought, what they really require is Iron Man. What they really require is philosophy. What they really require is a philosophical revolution that Ayn Rand would lead, who ideas would lead. And I mean, I, I, I sometimes fantasize about a world in which Mises and Hayek took Rand seriously. Not even, I mean, Mises took her somewhat seriously. I mean, he wrote maybe the nicest review ever of Atlas Shrugged that I've ever seen. He wrote this magnificent letter to Ayn Rand about what Atlas Shrugged meant to him. And how much he enjoyed it, and how important it was. 
And they used to have dinners regularly and they, they communicated. But at the end of the day, he couldn't accept philosophy. He couldn't accept philosophy as a, as a separate topic. Right? He was committed to his background. But imagine if they really taken it seriously. We would be 50, 60 years ahead of the curve in terms of the battle for freedom of It would be unimaginable where we would be. And we keep losing because libertarians keep insisting, and people who believe in liberty keep insisting that philosophy doesn't matter and that Ayn Rand is, is insignificant. She writes a good novel and inspires, but the philosophy is insignificant. It doesn't further the cause. And, and, and I think that's a huge mistake. I think it's a huge mistake. Economists in, of the liberty have made for the last 50, 60 years, and it's a mistake maybe your generation can fix, but it's crucial, it's urgent, we won't move forward unless we're willing to challenge the world out there on question of what is reason, is it important, how does it function, what does it mean, and then questions of morality. And those are the questions that lay the foundations for anything you build on top of it politically. Anything. Come on. That's right. Oh, no. I don't know how much time, but uh, it's, it's I'm willing, you know, go all <laughs> night. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to the lovely talk. Um, so, on this note of trying to change the system from the east, so I completely buy your your argument, your premise. I just I think that once you get someone to listen to the your own book show or to read Atlas Shrek, uh, you're done basically. The problem is how how do you get the, the person there? I think uh, that objectivism is full of loaded language, like some words that are scary and yep. ugly. Let's say it like this. Yep. So basically, what what we would need is a uh, Iran in every house, but you know, we cannot do it. So I think that I this is at least the way I see it. Maybe you already thought about it. Maybe you have a better solution. What the maybe the Ayn Rand Institute would need is some kind of like prayer university for mm -hmm. objectivism. I, I, I always recommend capitalism as a non ideal. Always. Yeah, capitalism is a non ideal. Yeah. Really, and it lays the philosophical foundations for the whole ideas of capitalism, why it's a moral system. But look, I, 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 we need a lot more content. And we need a prayer university like, but we're not good at five minute songwriting. So it doesn't need to be five minutes. Just so we've launched the Ayn Rand University. Uh, you can you can find it online. It has amazing courses. It has amazing content. Um, you can take live classes. You can get graded. Uh, you can join as a full time student. We're trying to train train the the future generations of intellectuals. We want hundreds of them, thousands of them. So we've got a university. It's not accredited, but it's an online university where we're training people to do exactly that. Um, Look, I mean, I, I like the idea that if, if only more people read Atlas Shrugged, but the reality is that millions and millions and millions of people have read Atlas Shrugged. And only a certain percentage of them take the two seats and do anything with it. Um, I have almost as many people unsubscribing to my show as subscribing. So just <laughs> listening to my show doesn't quite do it. Uh, some of you love it and, 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 and stay with it. Some of you leave. I friend people on a regular basis. Uh, and it's not because of language, it's because my ideas are controversial. I've, uh, you know, a lot of people on the right, a lot of libertarians, uh, love Putin. Uh, I hate Putin. I hate everything he represents and everything he's done. Um, and, uh, my, my advocacy against Russia and pro Ukraine has lost me a lot of subscribers to your books, for example, right? Uh, abortion. I can, I can list long topics that I lose subscribers over. This is a long-term, complicated, ideological battle. It's about ideas. It's about ideas people feel very passionate about, that, that are very at the heart and the core of, of the world. And it's just going to take a lot of work. And to do that work, we need lots of intellectuals. If you're interested in becoming one of those intellectuals, I encourage you to sign up for the Ironman University. So let me just quickly, yeah, because... So I think that this is the aiming at creating intellectuals. What I was talking about is like, uh, younger people, like maybe even children. So to remove the modern language. So basically, I'm quite sure that 
the first time someone encounters these ideas, you can almost build, you could probably write a prototype of the questions and the what's right. Well, with young ones and encounter these ideas for the first time. But you can talk, I know. You talk yeah. to people that never, uh, never listen to it and you'll see the questions and what yeah. scares, what doesn't scare. So maybe you could like prototype no. the. It's not quite good. We need a lot more intro, intro kind of texts. We need a lot more videos. We need a lot more material to bring people in. But it's not as simple as they read out the struggle and it's done. It's, it's ongoing work. And I think to produce all that content, we need a lot of intellectuals. So for now, we're at the stage where we need to create the intellectuals to create the content. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, in regards to the Austrian school that you appreciate it. And one of its backbones is the concept of objectivity and value. Yeah, in the sense of what goes in my mind, what the cards I like, the movies I like to watch. Do you think it's a useful concept exclusively within economics, or because you also mentioned that Rothbard is a moral subjectivist? Moral subjectivist. Yeah, but uh, so, so I don't, so I think it's badly labeled. Um, it's not the same. Yeah, it's subjectivism it, in, in the Austrian. The, yeah, but I think the idea the, of a subjective value, the way it's presented by Austrian economists, particularly Mises and Bork, and Ayn Rand's idea of objective value as applied to the marketplace are the same. I don't think there's a conflict. I don't think there's a contradiction between the two. There's actually an excellent essay by a guy named Rob Tarr, T A R O. Um, it's available online. It's available at Ayn Rand Institute. We made it public. It was in a journal somewhere that reconciles Rand's view of objective values and the Austrian view of subjective values in economics, in the marketplace, in trade. I don't think you can take that word subjective at, you know, to mean what it means when you apply it to ethics. Subjective means based on emotion and anything goes. And that's not what it means when it's applied to, even to the marketplace. Because you might want something at a particular price at a particular time, but you know your want doesn't make it so. Right, so something much more has to happen than just an emotional want, and that's what makes the subjective value in economics objective. It's it's everything else that comes along with it. But I encourage you to look at this article that Rob talked about. There's no conflict. Yeah. Uh, we have trust. Yeah. Uh, Paul, uh, players Helps the objectivist project. All right, so let's start with the objectivists versus libertarians. And the problem, I think, with libertarianism is that it, it, it doesn't really mean anything. It's too broad of a concept. Um, when you can have, um, you know, uh, 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 people right now uh, comparing Zelensky to Hitler uh, in the name of uh, the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, and narco caps who don't believe in immigration, who want to build walls. And you can have really good Cato writers who are doing really good work in economics and, you know, other libertarians who are doing really good work in economics. And you can have all of those, some completely crazy, nutty ideas and really, really good ideas all in one umbrella. I don't know what it means. And I don't want to be part of that umbrella because I don't want to be part of the the, the wackos over here, the crazy nuts who, who want to, you know, who, who, who want to do crazy things, right? Um, so I don't like the term and I don't use it very much because I think it's too broad. And it doesn't actually mean anything, uh, uh, you know, in, in the way the way it's used. Uh, when somebody says I'm a libertarian, I don't know what that means because you know, are you a Republican who likes a little bit of free markets? That's what we used to call we used to call Republican libertarians, right? They were, are you, uh, you know, again, somebody who wants anarchy? Or are you somebody who wants Putin? Or are you somebody who loves Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it means. I have no idea. So, objectivism, I know exactly what it means. You might agree with it, you might disagree with it, but it's a set view and it's, and it's a set philosophical view. Again, libertarianism is 
You can be religious, you can be utilitarian, you can be Aristotelian, you can be any philosophy. As long as we agree on some vague ideas of liberty, you're all a libertarian. So I two. personally compare, uh, I'm defending the libertarian side, That's right. <laughs> I, I compare the, the libertarian movement with us many sometimes opposition, uh, as we know, <laughs> well, opposition and uh, contradictory, but somewhat as Marxism and socialism in the end of the 19th century. They were terrible, and still are, terrible in fighting between Marxists and Maoists, so they, they were, but they were able to catch up the 20th century with all, all those contradictions. And they were wrong. <laughs> so we have a contradictory, contradictory uh, movement, maybe, and with the several infightings sometimes, but uh, at least we are, uh, we are more, more uh, we are right, so, uh, in, in, the, in the several views of libertarianism. So, uh, so I think uh, 21 uh, century, maybe, <laughs> will we'll change something. Uh, so I think it should be narrow. I think what, what a meaningful use of libertarianism should be narrower than as broad as it is today. And then the other question you had was about um, uh, Christianity. Christianity. Yeah, I, I mean, any anything? Uh, I don't know of any. Uh, I mean, the only value I can think of. I mean, I'm not an expert in Christianity. I wasn't raised Christian, uh, and uh, but the only value I think that Rand saw in Christianity um, was. The idea of individual salvation, that is the idea that the individual matter in a world in which the individual didn't matter, in which, you know, was pretty barbaric. Um, this idea of salvation, the idea of individual salvation, not sal salvation as a group, but it, it emphasized the value of individual and therefore individualism. Now, that's what Rand said. I'm a little skeptical because I think that idea of the individual already existed in Greece before the rise of Christianity. So I, have no use of Christianity. I, I, I don't see the value there at all. I think it's a detriment. I think it makes it much harder for us to win the battle because I think it's collectivist and altruist and, and anti-reason. Um, but again, you know, there are going to be people um, who argue for liberty from a Christian perspective. I just don't think it's convincing and I don't think it, 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 it passes the, uh, the, the reason threshold. Okay, uh, I think we can. One more? Yeah. No. Okay, so the last one. Yeah. Like again. So I never really thought understood why Kant is associated with reason and freedom and the enlightenment. And so I can lay down a bit about Kant's. Well, a lot of it is just history, right? So Kant comes at the end of the enlightenment, he writes a very famous essay. What is you know what is enlightenment? He, he in a sense names the period before him as enlightenment. He's the guy who kind of characterizes it. So uh, he's associated in that sense. I mean, Rand viewed uh, him as the guy who destroyed the enlightenment. Right? Actually, puts the nail in the coffin of the enlightenment, or sets in motion the destruction of the enlightenment uh, because of his ideas about reason. So he's big on reason. But his idea is that reason doesn't really give us knowledge about what's out there because we can't never know what's out there. So, so reality, he separates reality from reason. By separating reality from reason, he separates the mind from reality and, and, and undermines the whole enlightenment project. Right? Um, and then he's got a whole ethic of duty and an ethic of, of, of altruism, uh, an anti egoistic ethic. But he's associated with it because of. Where he comes, his importance. He's the most important philosopher of the last two thousand years, and uh, you know the fact that he ends a certain period, but names it as well. And most historians of ideas call Kant a, a figure of the enlightenment. Last question. Last one. Last one. Really, last one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to a Portuguese young man and woman? Uh, the, uh, some of people here are older, like yeah. me, but uh, there yeah. are lots of young people here. But the advice I mean, I would say read Iron Man. A lot of you I know haven't read Iron Man. It's worth reading. 
Um, suddenly her, her novels are amazing. Now, it's an experience. Even if you decide not to agree with her, Dan, you'll, you'll have lived um, the Fountain and Atlas Shrugged, and that's, a, that's a, an amazing experience just to live it. Uh, but if, if you like what you read in Atlas Shrugged and the Fountain Head, I, I encourage you to study the ideas. And, and today, there are more tools to study the ideas than ever before. As I said, there's an Iron Man University. There's a million videos out there of me, of, of, of Leonard Peacock, more importantly, with students, of other philosophers uh, talking about Rand's ideas, applying them to a million different ways, to a million different things. Um, th there's just such a richness of content today that it's it's truly amazing. Take advantage of it. Go online, search on Rand. Uh, I'm an institute because uh, there's a lot of junk out there as well. But uh, I'm an institute produces really good stuff on Iron Man. Uh, and, and it, you know, applying her philosophy uh, really, really well. So don't let it just sit there on YouTube. Uh, actually watch it, share it, uh, and enjoy it. Okay, thank you very much. And, and, uh, and subscribe to the Iran Bookshop.